It was 35 years ago at the dawn of the slasher movie genre when the date of Friday the 13th became synonymous with Jason Voorhees. When it comes to 80s slasher films, the Friday the 13th series is the standard. Somehow these movies manage to get made every year all through the 80s, except 83 and 87. You couldn't stop them. They were as consistent and familiar as ACDC albums. You always knew what you were going to get. But these Friday the 13th guys, they've made the same movie nine times. That takes talent. It's one of the few strings of sequels where the main recurring character who you cheer for is a masked killer. Because these movies are so absurd and make-believe, we take some kind of sick enjoyment out of seeing Jason slaughter everybody for no good reason. Jason is as appealing as Godzilla in the sense that he's an unstoppable machine who takes a lot of abuse and keeps on going. He doesn't give a fuck about anything. More of the appeal comes from how trashy these movies are. These are prime examples of cinematic exploitation gone amuck, juggling violence and sex with shameless dark humor throughout. Watching these is a guilty pleasure. But who am I kidding? These movies are fucking awesome. They have a strong fan base, which I think was helped fueled because they never got any respect from the critics and the rest of the film industry. When somebody tells you you're not supposed to watch something and it's terrible, that makes people want to see them even more. Just like the characters in the movies who are always doing things they're not supposed to. I like to think of these as summer movies. They have a social atmosphere with a bunch of characters always on vacation who are just trying to get away from the rest of the world and don't have any care. They're the kind of movies best watched with a group of friends or alone in the dark late at night. They also helped independent filmmakers get into making slasher movies because they're relatively easy to start out with. They don't require much clever writing, they're built on cliches, and they can be shot all in the woods without a lot of money. The first Friday the 13th was shot only on an estimated $550,000. Even as a kid, I knew of Jason Voorhees, even though I was too young to see any of the movies. They were forbidden and unspeakable, but still I went out trick-or-treating as Jason. He was that much of an icon where everybody knew Jason, even without having any knowledge of the films themselves. I played the NES game, so that front cover was the only image I ever saw from the films, my only glimpse into an adult world. In my teenage years, after I got into horror movies, I first saw the Friday the 13th films on TNT's Monster Vision. For more info on that, you should check out my video all about Monster Vision. This was when Joe Bob Briggs hosted an all-night marathon of parts 1 through 6. This put me in the right kind of mood because these movies work good as late-night kind of movies. Then in 2006, when I was working on my Angry Nerd review of the video game, I watched the entire series on DVD for my first time. In the years since, I've highlighted Friday the 13th in my Monster Madness History of Horror. I recorded an interview of myself for the documentary His Name Was Jason. The nerd video was included in the extras. I also made a Top 13 video listing my favorite moments from the series. So Friday the 13th has always been well represented on Cinemassacre. But the only thing left to do is review the individual movies one at a time, which has probably been my biggest request for Monster Madness every year. It'll be hard to do because all the parts that are most worthy to talk about I already mentioned in my Top 13 video. I remember the series best for select moments, and I had to cover the Halloween series first because Halloween started the whole slasher craze, and of course I had to do all the great horror franchises from the Golden Age and Silver Age. Slashers would be the Bronze Age. Well, since there's three Friday the 13th this year on the calendar, I guess there's no escaping it. Let's look at each of these movies one at a time and see how well they hold up. The first thing I had to do was watch all the movies again to get them fresh in my mind. Now that they're all out on Blu-ray, it couldn't have been more perfect. I love when they get entire film franchises out on a single Blu-ray set. This is a really great package with booklets and a ton of bonus features. It was also very nice to see the Halloween series get the same Blu-ray treatment, where previously the DVD rights were owned by so many different companies that you had no choice but to buy them all separately. So here's what I'll be doing. I'll be reviewing Friday the 13th parts 1 through 5 leading up to this Friday, Friday the 13th. Then give me some time to finish the rest and I'll post parts 6 through 10 ending on Friday the 13th in March. That means the last one will be Jason X. I've already reviewed Freddy vs. Jason and the 2009 version before. Hopefully I don't go too crazy like Joe Bob did. Let's begin. 
The first Friday the 13th was directed by Sean Cunningham. It takes place at Camp Crystal Lake, which was filmed on a real campground in New Jersey. The actual name of the campground in real life is Nobi Bosco, which is a private property. It's strange that the movie Halloween, even though it was shot in California, was set in the fictional town of Haddonfield, Illinois, which was inspired by Haddonfield, New Jersey. My friends and I used to ride the school bus through that town, and we would always joke to look out for Michael Myers without knowing that the setting of the movie was actually inspired by that town because the producer and co-writer Deborah Hill grew up there. I don't mean to get off topic, but the point is, both Friday the 13th and Halloween came from New Jersey. I guess it's just a slasher kind of state. Speaking of Halloween, it has to be said that Friday the 13th would have never existed without it. And of course, there were movies before Halloween, like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Twitch of the Death Nerve, and Black Christmas, but the familiar slasher format with all its cliches first took complete full shape with Halloween. Halloween basically started the whole thing, or made it popular, but here's what Friday the 13th did differently. It put the setting in a campground. The idea of being out in the woods where the killer could be hiding behind any tree became a cliché in its own right. In Halloween, the horror comes to a neighborhood, but in Friday the 13th, the characters are in the woods, out of their home element. Instead of the horror coming to them, they go to the horror. From the beginning, they make it clear that Camp Crystal Lake is a bad place to go. This place is cursed. It's the horror tradition that goes all the way back to Jonathan Harker traveling to Castle Dracula. You mustn't go there. A camp counselor on her way over is told the story of how a young boy named Jason Voorhees drowned in the lake and a bunch of murders happened afterwards. Because of that, the camp was closed down for many years, but now it's reopened and the same kind of murders continue. The characters all act with no care in the world. What the fuck? He could have killed her! The movie does a fairly good job at building an ominous mood. We can feel that something bad is going to happen. And when it does, there are some gory highlights, like when Kevin Bacon gets an arrow through the neck, number 12 in my top 13 Friday moments. The special effects were done by Tom Savini, who was fresh off from doing Dawn of the Dead. Unfortunately, lots of the gory bits were cut short because of the MPAA saying that they would give it an X rating otherwise. It's a shame because Tom Savini really did a good job. Just listen to Joe Bob. And all Tom's best work is exactly what they cut out. It's like the better job he does, the more they want to cut it because it looks too real. If there's any movie that Friday the 13th ripped off, I think it's mostly Psycho for the music because it sounds just like it. So what about all the non-highlights, the moments nobody cares to talk about? And there's plenty of them. How about the scene where she makes coffee? They show the entire process. It's true that sometimes in order to make the scary scenes have a stronger effect, you need to have the calm moments, but there's way too much of it. The movie is very slow for the most part, but in the last 15 minutes it picks up. Spoiler alert for those of you who haven't seen it, if you want to be surprised by the ending, stop the video here. Okay, so this is when the last survivor, Alice, meets Mrs. Voorhees, who at first seems to be real friendly, but then she reveals that she's the mother of the boy, Jason, who drowned in the lake. She's the one who murdered everybody for the death of her boy, and even though she's crazy, she at least has a motive that makes her character believable. I mean, still, none of these camp counselors are any of the ones responsible. Look what you did to him! And then she starts talking in Jason's voice, which is real disturbing. Kill her, Mommy! Kill her! It's just like the split personality that Norman Bates has in Psycho. But in that movie, it's the son speaking in the mother's voice. So basically, Friday the 13th is like Psycho reversed. Mrs. Voorhees, played by Betsy Palmer, is the best part of the film. She's terrifying because, in one instance, she's nice, and then she flips out. It's kind of funny that after all the elaborate kills she's been doing, she resorts to slapping. I wonder what the movie would have been like if Mrs. Voorhees was a main character instead of introducing her in the last 15 minutes. Had she been there all along, interacting with the camp counselors and being friendly, it would have come as more a surprise when she snaps. It also must be a big surprise for any first-time viewers who imagine that Jason would be the killer. So then Alice decapitates Mrs. Voorhees. She gets on a canoe, the morning light comes, she's safe, and everything's fine. 
Number one moment in my top 13 Friday moments. When I first saw this, it made my heart jump into my throat. I was finally convinced that Jason is not in this movie. And after all, nothing supernatural happens up until this point. The whole film is grounded in reality. After an hour and a half runtime, you think Jason is really dead in this movie, but then this creepy zombie kid jumps up out of nowhere. Even to this day, re-watching the scene and knowing it's coming, I find it very unsettling. Even the music, which is deceivingly peaceful, I find to be deeply disturbing. I think there's only a handful of horror movie scenes that prey so effectively on your senses. But then, she wakes up. Jason. Jason? Why did they piss away the ending like this? It should have ended right when Jason pulled her into the water. Right there when the camera dips down to the water, that was the perfect opportunity. Fade to black, end it right there, and leave us with that uncomfortable feeling. It would have been perfect, but they blew it. To sum things up, the whole final act with Mrs. Voorhees and Jason is excellent, and there are some good moments earlier, but there's so much filler throughout that I can't really call this a major classic. Even though it started a whole franchise and its sequels outnumber Halloween, I don't think it holds up as well today as Halloween or Texas Chainsaw Massacre do. After all, it doesn't even have the hockey mask Jason that we all know and love. The movie isn't so important for what it is, but for what it started. Following the success of the first Friday the 13th movie, the sequel was rushed into production and released the following year. It was shot in Connecticut this time instead of New Jersey. I think they ought to stick with their roots. Jason is a Jersey guy, you know what I mean? It's a true sequel in a sense that it feels just like a continuation of the first movie, for better and for worse. The same sort of things happen all over again. The tone just feels like the first movie. It moves along at a very slow pace. The production quality is a little better. Supposedly the budget was a little over a million dollars, whereas the first one was just over half a million. The plot is nothing out of the ordinary. A new group of people arrive at the campground and are all killed off. The characters are all new because there's nobody left alive from the first movie, except Alice, and guess what? She gets killed before the opening credits, in her own home. Of course, I'm sure everybody knows by now, Jason Voorhees is the killer in this movie, and from now on. It makes sense to me that Jason would kill her because she decapitated his mother. What doesn't make sense is why he goes around killing everybody else, too, but who cares? Maybe it's just a territorial thing. The campground is like his home. Anyway, with Alice out of the way, there's no more recurring characters. Well, scratch that. There's the You're Doomed guy, but even he meets his demise. It should be said that unlike the Halloween series, there's no Laurie Strode or Dr. Loomis equivalent, no recurring characters to get to know or relate to. I think that's something that's missing that could have made these films better. What I do like is the backstory of Jason, how he drowned in the lake. It gives it more of an urban legend kind of feel. The body was never found, so nobody even knows if Jason was real or not. The campfire scene alone sets the perfect mood. There's an early example of the prankster stereotype, the guy who puts on a mask and scares people before the real killer shows up. It's a big cliché, soon to be repeated in the sequels and countless other films. Of course, there's also the car won't start cliché. There's the girl with the ass that gets its own close-up. Then the pervert guy comes out of the woods and slingshots her. And he's not even the slightest bit coy about it. He stares her right down with that sneaky grin. Number 8 in my top 13 moments. Later on, she's swimming naked, and he takes her clothes away. Fucking pervert! One big cliché that gets used way too often here is the infamous POV shot. Half the movie is just people running from the camera. Then there's the dead dog. Don't kill the dog. Nobody likes that. Kill the people instead. One of the main rules of horror films is that you can kill as many people as you want to, but you never kill a pet. People get upset. By the way, to everyone who says that Jason never runs, look at that. What do you call that? A fast walk? After the hour mark, the movie picks up. Like always, it's the final chase scene that makes it worthwhile, although it's nowhere near as good as the finale from the first movie. And it's a little, um, what's the word? Slapsticky. Yeah, I mean, anytime the scary villain is kicked in the balls, what can you say? 
Some of the chase takes place in Jason's makeshift home, which he built in the woods using parts of different things. It's a nice addition, and it should be said that the way Jason is portrayed in this movie is more like a realistic hermit instead of a supernatural killing machine. The fact that he keeps his mother's head on display is an effectively eerie touch. I wonder how Jason got his mother's sweater, but not her body. Maybe they thought it would be too much like Psycho, or she had more than one of the same sweater. I've always wondered what the series would have been like if Mrs. Voorhees came back more often in some shape or form. Jason, mother is talking to you! From here on out, the whole focus became on Jason. Of course, as you can see, Jason's wearing a sack over his head instead of the famous hockey mask, which doesn't happen till part three. So we're two movies in, and it's still not the Jason that everybody knows. This makes the series a little more interesting to me than the Halloween series because everything that you want to see gets introduced gradually, so it savors the experience when watching all these movies in order. There's been a lot of confusion on what exactly happened with Jason. It seems most people are under the impression that Jason never actually drowned in the lake and that he's been living in the woods ever since. This leaves you wondering how Mrs. Voorhees never found him all those years since. My assumption had always been that Jason first rose from the lake after the death of his mother and he's been a zombie all this time. The only monkey wrench in that idea is that the Jason we saw at the end of part one was a young boy. In part two, he's an adult, which in itself is debatable. He looks small to me. In further sequels, they always seem to beef him up more, so I always assumed he was still growing. The one moment where I can concede he's probably an adult in part two is at the end you see his face. He looks much different, especially having gone from bald to having long hair. Then you raise the question, if he's a zombie, do zombies age? If they do, his growth rate between parts one and two would make enough sense to me because they take place five years apart. That's enough time for a youth to grow drastically. But then everything gets confusing because he drowned back in the 50s. The first Friday the 13th takes place in the present time. He would have rotted away by then. So the only thing to explain him being a young boy in part one is that it was just a hallucination or a dream. But I don't like that. That's my favorite moment. I want it to be real. But then again, none of it's real because it's just a movie, so fuck it. Anyway, Friday the 13th Part 3 was the first and only of the series to be shot in 3D. This was during the 80s revival of 3D, after it had first been popularized in the 50s. And now, today, 3D is commonplace again, because, I don't know, for some reason 3D comes into fashion once every 30 years. Who knows why. It was also part of the cliché of having Part 3 be in 3D, like Jaws 3D and Amityville 3D. I do have to say it lives up to what it advertises, with things always coming at the screen. Nowadays, movies are always 3D even when they have no purpose to be. Some commend the 3D of some modern movies of not being gimmicky and enhancing the story more or whatever, but it's 3D. It's a fucking gimmick. Throw shit at the screen. That's the whole point. The problem is that today you can't see this movie in 3D, so now all you have is a bunch of idiots flinging yo-yos at the camera for no reason. Sure, the Blu-ray set includes the 3D version, but it's the red and blue type. The glasses are included, which is cool that they made it to look like Jason's hockey mask, but I tried it out and everything still looks like double to me. I haven't been able to see anything look like it's popping off the screen at all. This is a movie that demands a proper 3D release on an actual 3D disc made for 3D televisions. Three-dimensional or not, the characters are just as two-dimensional as you'd expect. You have a bunch of stoners out on vacation, a biker gang who gives them a lot of trouble, and somewhere in the middle of it all, Jason Voorhees hacking them up. You have a prankster who takes it as far as possible, always playing a morbid joke in every other scene. You know, if this same movie was made today, is there any chance that this guy wouldn't be played by Seth Rogen? <laughs> this guy happens to be the one who accidentally gives Jason the idea of the hockey mask, something that really catches on. This shot right here is the first time you see Jason with the hockey mask on. Movie history is made. So for those who want to see the Jason that everybody expects, this is the first movie that has that. Look at him run! There he goes again! Also, this one has greater production quality yet. Once again, the budget was doubled. This time it was about two and a half million dollars. 
As a result, it feels a little bit more mainstream than the first two. I think modern audiences might find this one more watchable. I personally find it to be more entertaining than parts one and two. The kills are pretty good. Once again, there's no real reason why Jason kills everybody. I guess he just hates all people. The psycho shower shot is imitated. There's a good Fangoria magazine with Godzilla, have to point that out. The sign in the store says Green Valley, New Jersey, so if you ever wanted to know where the Friday the 13th story takes place, there you go. Although this movie was filmed in California. Some of it at Velluze Ranch, where I've filmed that before. Strange to note that it takes place the following day after part two. I guess Saturday the 14th didn't sound quite as catchy. How did Jason grow into such a big hulking man all of a sudden? To make things even more confusing, one of the girls remembers being attacked by Jason years earlier, and according to the flashback, it's the same looking Jason that we see now. It's a tendency that the third installments in franchises like to employ retroactive continuity, like Son of Frankenstein, third in the Universal series, and Evil of Frankenstein, third in the Hammer series. The final chase scene is entertaining as always, but again full of slapstick moments. Jason gets beaten up way too much. What is he, backing up? Like, don't hurt me! Jason's a pussy! The moment that always sticks out to me is when Jason lifts up his mask and sneers. As if he knows he's scary. And she recognizes him as the man she encountered years ago. They did a good job on Jason's face. I remember being surprised that you see his face so much. In the Halloween series, they make such a big deal about the secrecy of Michael Myers' face, but in the Friday the 13th series, they show his face in just about every installment. Come to think of it, why does he wear a mask anyway? Spoiler alert if anybody cares, the ending is another strange and ambiguous one. After putting an axe in Jason's head, she gets on a canoe where she sees him still alive coming after her. Then, all of a sudden, Mrs. Voorhees jumps out of the water, no longer decapitated. I'm pretty sure it's just a dream. And then, she wakes up. The police escort her away, and Jason's body is still laying there with the axe still in his head. If this were any other killer, you'd say he was dead. But at the time, they had officially killed off Jason Voorhees. It's hard to believe that Part 3 was intended to be the last, to end it as a trilogy, but it was so successful that it went on. You just can't keep Jason down. Friday the 13th, the final chapter, we all know, was not even close to being the final chapter. There's never been an attempt to retroactively retitle it to Friday the 13th Part 4. Every new release proudly keeps the final chapter on there, a testament to how we like to celebrate the franchise for all its faults. If you're planning to watch just one Friday the 13th movie, I'd recommend this one, especially because it begins with a tight recap of the first three movies. It picks up right after part three. Jason, who just had an axe put through his head, is taken to the morgue where the coroner is busy watching this. What the hell is that? Number nine in my top 13 moments. Apparently, it's a real workout video called Aerobicize, the beautiful workout. It's just one of those funny moments like in Troll 2 when the characters are watching something ridiculous on the TV. Then Jason gets up and kills the guy. The following day, another group of people arrive to the Camp Crystal Lake vicinity to a cabin they rented. I guess this would now be Sunday the 15th. One of the neighboring houses is where the Jarvis family lives, so there's two groups of characters that we follow. In most of these movies, the characters are very forgettable, but here we have two that stick out that are somewhat relatable. There's Tommy Jarvis, played by Corey Feldman, who's a kid obsessed with monsters and has a great talent for making special effects. I should mention Tom Savini is back doing the effects for this movie, so this kid is sort of like a young version of Tom Savini. On the other side, you have Jim, played by Crispin Glover, who's kind of shy and awkward, but he tries his best to fit in. He asks a girl to dance, but what he puts on is a metal song by Lion, and he flips out. Number six on my top 13 moments. He's a temperamental character. He always loses his shit over simple things. He thinks that's funny. He thinks that's a funny thing he's doing. He's the character who you want to see happy. You want to see him get the girl. There's subtle moments like this that make this sequel better than the rest. 
We still have Jason going around killing everybody. We'll always have that. But what we don't get that often is characters that we actually care about. It's also not often when one of the main characters is a kid. This helps make it more relatable, and it's funny that he keeps accidentally catching glimpses of naked women. He's just like the average kid who might have seen these movies at a young age, who, just like Tommy, it was their first look into the forbidden adult world. The kills are top-notch in this one. I mean, just fucking brutal. The Tom Savini skills are a welcome return, but it's a shame that the MPAA made them edit so much of it out. The Blu-ray has an entire bonus feature showing all the raw footage from the kills, and it's amazing to see how much of it there still exists and in near-perfect quality. One of Jason's early kills is a hitchhiker, and there's no reason for it whatsoever. What did she ever do wrong? Everybody always says that it's the people who have sex are the ones who die, but in these movies, that's not always true. Jason kills everyone. The hitchhiker scene sets the tone and lets you know that you're not supposed to take these movies seriously at all. So far in each movie, it's a different guy playing Jason. This time, it's Ted White who had a long career as a stuntman. Supposedly, he was a stuntman on Creature from the Black Lagoon. I haven't been able to find any more information on that or what part he was in the movie, but I wonder, did he actually play the creature at any point? I've always thought of Jason as a monster from the lake, so if the same guy played the creature and Jason, that would blow my mind. In a couple of the interviews on the Blu-rays, Ted White says that he didn't like Corey Feldman. He said that he was a spoiled kid, a mean little devil, and that's what gave Ted the motivation for his character. He really wanted to get Corey. The final sequence is a doozy, just for the number of things that get smashed and broken. Okay, spoiler alert. Let's talk about the ending. I know it's not a huge surprise, but Tommy shaves his head, I guess to look like Jason or whatever, and then kills him. Yep, all that time, it's a kid who kills Jason. No effort was made to explain how Jason survived an axe to the head, but now all they do is more of the same kind of thing. And this was supposed to be Jason's definitive death. Really? Well, to be fair, the special effects help sell it. We actually see Jason's head slide down the blade. It's absolutely grotesque. Tommy being so weird and maniacal makes this number seven on my top 13 moments. Next thing, Tommy stares at the camera, I guess trying to hint that he's going to grow up like Jason. It's ironic that this was meant to be the last Friday the 13th movie, but all it did was help give it more life than ever. Friday the 13th Part 5, A New Beginning, begins with a nightmare scene with Tommy Jarvis, the character from Part 4. They were able to get Corey Feldman again, but his career was beginning to take off at this point, so they only had him for this one scene. When he wakes up from the nightmare, we see that many years have passed, and he's now a grown man. Following his freakout at the end of Part 4, he spent all those years in an institution and is now being transferred to a community to live in. He still keeps having visions of Jason, which he can't get out of his head. But he's far from being the most disturbed character in the mix. There's this one guy who keeps offering everybody a chocolate bar. Everybody finds him annoying, but when he approaches an angry guy chopping wood, that turns out to be a total disaster. Leave me alone! So, right off the bat, somebody who isn't Jason commits a murder. It comes out of nowhere, and it's all over a chocolate bar. My friends and I used to laugh about it on the school bus, and that was before I saw the movie and only heard about the scene by word of mouth. Because it's so unexpected and uncalled for, it made number 11 in my top 13 moments. As you can see, the murder happens off screen. You never actually see the axe hitting, and that's the way most of the kills are, unfortunately. Ask me if I'm happy about that. I'm not. Oh. Again, that's because the MPAA made them edit so much out. The most effective of all the kills that I think didn't suffer too much is the guy who gets his head crushed against a tree by a belt. The rest of the characters are all crazy. I mean, completely over-the-top insane. It's kind of like if you took all the characters from Texas Chainsaw Massacre Parts 2 and 3 and put them all together in one movie. There's nobody to relate to. Even Tommy takes a back seat to this flying circus of maniacs. I'm not sure if this was trying to be like a dark comedy or what. There's so much going on, I've even forgotten which movie I'm watching. 
In general, there's lots of characters. New characters are always getting introduced, so you never get a chance to get used to anybody. The good side is that you're watching a slasher movie, and if you came to see a bunch of idiots get slashed, then it delivers. There are at least 20 kills in this movie, making it one of the largest body counts in the franchise. The bad side is that the movie should have been about Tommy Jarvis, but there's too much else going on that we never have a chance to focus on him. It's a shame because he's one of the few recurring characters in the franchises. We need a main character to relate to, and we never get that. Still, I find this movie to be extremely entertaining. I remember it best for individual awkward, funny moments like this. I want to make love with you. <laughs> I, I, I said I, I didn't mean it. The guy overcomes his insecurity to ask a point-blank question, gets rejected, and then gets pissed off at her. It's a truly funny, unique interaction, but what does it have to do with the plot? Nothing. Then there's the girl alone in her room robot dancing. Again, it has no purpose at all, but once you've seen it, how can you forget it? And if you're looking for a movie with the car won't start cliche, this movie uses it to the max. Even the chainsaw won't start. Strangely, when Joe Bob was hosting it, the drive-in totals wouldn't work. In fact, I've been having some technical difficulties with this video. You know what? Avoid this movie. It's cursed. You want to talk about the ending? Spoiler alert. Big spoiler alert. Ready? Here we go. The ending of Friday the 13th Part 5 reveals the killer to not be Jason. All along, it was the paramedic who we see earlier who comes in after the guy with the chocolate bar is killed. Guess what? That was his son. So because his son was murdered, he decided to dress up like Jason and go on a killing spree. Well, why did he end up killing even more people in one movie than even Jason himself normally would? Who knows? The guy just really flipped out, I guess. And if you stop and think about it, all the killing was all because of the death of his son who offered a chocolate bar to the wrong person. The whole entire movie was because of a chocolate bar. The idea was probably to mislead the audience into suspecting Tommy to be the killer, or the axe guy, but it doesn't work. I think by part five, everybody was so used to Jason being the killer that none of these possibilities were handled well enough to earn our interest. Of course, lots of people thought it was a big cop-out that Jason wasn't the killer this time, but it at least tries somewhat to deliver what the ending of Part 4 promised, with Jason being officially dead and Tommy going insane, even though the focus shifts away from him. The ending, once again, teases that Tommy's going to be the next Jason. Oh, really? This time? For sure? All this bullshit is just like the ending of Halloween Part 4, and they never followed up on that. I do have to say, I like the idea of the copycat killer. I think part five was onto something. The thought of any person putting on a hockey mask and committing a series of murders is something that could actually happen. That idea is scarier than any supernatural slasher villain. It brings me to a theory of mine where none of the sequels feature Jason at all. He has a completely different body type in each installment anyway. What if each time it was just somebody else copying him? Even the retroactive continuity in Part 3 flashes back to show the Jason from that movie, which supposedly took place years before the Jason we see in Part 2. And if we're going by the idea that the ending of Part 1 was a hallucination or a dream, then we could say that when Jason drowned, he drowned, and that was it. Ever since Mrs. Voorhees attacked, it's all these different faceless psychopathic killers that have been in the area that have been blamed on Jason for lack of identity and the over-imagination of everybody keeping Jason's memory alive. Or, Jason possibly never even existed at all. It was just an urban legend. That's why he's immortal, because nobody can forget him. Part 5 can be considered one of the worst, or one of the best, depending on which way you look at it. It opened up some interesting ideas that unfortunately were muddled and never came to fruition. It's a complete mess, but I definitely find it to be one of the most interesting and the most entertaining. Friday the 13th Part 6, Jason Lives, is like a new start because it re-establishes Jason Voorhees as the main focus. It opens with a full moon and a foggy forest. 
It's refreshing to see one of these films begin with atmosphere and mood rather than modern exploitation. Thunderstorms and cemeteries never get old. We can thank the director, Tom McLaughlin, for turning to classic horror films for inspiration. In the Blu-ray extras, he said he wanted this to be the type of movie that you can watch in black and white. So if you turn the color off on your TV, it would look like it was meant to be that way. After all, the opening scene is very reminiscent of the opening of Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman, where two grave robbers open the tomb of the Wolfman and accidentally bring him back to life. Tommy Jarvis, the character from parts 4 and 5, along with a friend, go to the grave of Jason Voorhees. For what purpose? Well, Tommy just needs to make sure that he's really dead. He looks pretty damn dead. What a disgusting looking corpse. Props to the props department. But Tommy isn't satisfied, so he grabs a metal rod from a nearby gate and stabs the fuck out of Jason like old times. It's also convenient that Tommy brought along Jason's old hockey mask, which he's kept safe ever since. It even still has the same axe mark from Part 3, probably the most impressive respect to continuity that any of these films have ever managed. Then a lightning bolt strikes the rod, sending electricity into Jason's body, charging him up like a battery that's been dead, and that's all it takes to bring him back. The lightning bolt resurrection is almost a cliché that goes back to Ghost of Frankenstein. Most people say this is the first movie where Jason is a zombie, even though I've always thought of him as a zombie ever since he drowned in the lake. So the part where the guy gets his heart ripped out was cut short. The MPAA made him cut that. And then, of course, TNT got a hold of it. Now it looks like he just gets pushed to death. When you see Jason put on the mask and turn around, that's one of his shining moments. It's just like the first time when you see the Frankenstein monster. And then, what? A James Bond spoof in a Friday the 13th film? This whole pre credit scene, which made number 13 on my top 13 moments, is just like a Bond film. It gets the movie started and you cheer for Jason Voorhees the same way you would with James Bond. The rest of the movie is downhill. If you've seen the beginning, I would just leave it at that. There's nothing too special about the rest, but it does exactly what it advertised and doesn't try to be anything more than what it is. There's more references to classic horror films like the name of the grocery store, Karloff's. The best part of the movie is Jason, without a doubt. For some reason, he just keeps getting cooler with every installment. This time, he's been fully elevated to a supernatural killer, a movie monster, doing kills that are impossible for a human being to do. One of my favorite parts is when he kills the driver of an RV, which causes a spectacular crash. It's moments like these that make Jason into some kind of action anti-hero. Other minor highlights, there's the cemetery caretaker, who is a great-looking character, though his role is very brief. In the original ending, according to the storyboards, it's explained that he's paid to look after Mrs. Voorhees' grave by Mr. Voorhees. That's right, Jason's dad. Then there's the pissed-off paintball guy. Then I have to point out a sort of editing gag. Does he think I'm a fart head? <laughs> Why was that necessary? You know what? Anytime I make any kind of statement, I wish I had a crowd of kids saying, Yeah! During the kills, you hardly see anything. Aren't the MPAA a bunch of fart heads? Yeah! You know, that rug. My family had that same rug back in the 80s. Must have been a common rug. That's some pretty interesting trivia, isn't it? Yeah! One thing that adds to the appeal of Part 6 is that they got Alice Cooper on the soundtrack, which was something that just had to happen. Overall, Part 6 is a fun movie, as long as you don't expect much from it. It's very self-aware with humor spread throughout. It can be considered fresh because how it invigorates Jason, making him more badass than before, and it has a bigger budget, about $3 million, and more polished look than the previous installments. But it can also be considered stale because it's very formula-based. It doesn't do anything new or interesting with the story. And maybe that's because it's part six and there wasn't a whole lot left to do. The big missed opportunity was the character of Tommy. Notice how I haven't talked about him much because he's so forgettable. He never does anything interesting. He's just kind of there. This is a character who's supposed to be disturbed, having a traumatic past with Jason. He's the closest we come to a Laurie Strode equivalent, but it never really amounts to anything. I think it also has something to do with Tommy being played by a different actor in each movie, so you never get time to get used to one person. This is the last of the Tommy trilogy. 
Corey Feldman has expressed some interest in returning as Tommy in a future sequel, giving it sort of an H2O treatment, just picking up from part four and ignoring everything in between. I wouldn't mind that, wouldn't you? Friday the 13th Part 7, The New Blood, begins with a young girl, Tina, who's running away from her drunken and abusive father. Her emotions are so strong that it causes some sort of telekinetic reaction. A Jedi power, if you will, tearing down the dock, trapping him underwater, and killing him. All by accident, from a power she didn't know she had. Years later, as an adult, Tina revisits the dock out of guilt and wishes she could bring him back. Well, it just so happens that Jason Voorhees is under the lake after having been chopped up by the propeller of a boat at the end of Part 6. Even though his eyes opened before the credits rolled, I guess he's supposed to have been dead all that time, and after all these years, Tina's powers bring him back to life. Now that Jason's walking about again, he immediately gets back to business, hacking people up. But you won't see much of that, thanks to the MPAA. Luckily, you can see all the deleted gory bits on the Blu-ray extras. The image quality sucks, but it's better than nothing. Isn't it a shame to see Jason pick up a giant weed whacker, or whatever kind of power tool this is, and build up to an amazing kill, only to cut away and not show us anything? Here's what you missed. Then there's the sleeping bag kill, which is one of Jason's funniest kills ever. In the final edit, you only see him smack the body against the tree once. Just once. But if it wasn't for the MPAA, it would have been several hits. The worst cut of all was when Jason squishes a guy's head. You see nothing, but originally, there was this awesome special effect. Oh, man! The movie suffers from the same usual thing. You don't care about anything but Jason. As far as the other characters are concerned, there's Tina, who we already mentioned. Then there's, um... Nobody else worth mentioning, except maybe this geeky girl who reminds me of the boy-crazy Irma from Ninja Turtles. Let's get back to Jason, then. He's played by Kane Hodder for the first time, the only guy who had the balls to play Jason more than once. Since Jason is a role that requires a lot of stunts, it always made sense to use actors who can do their own stunts. He gave Jason a little more personality, like he's fucking pissed off all the time. Also, it's the best-looking Jason of the whole series. The way he looks in this movie is just like he's been through seven movies. Part of the mask is broken off, his clothing is all ragged, and you can see parts of his bones underneath. I also like how you see him in water more often, reminding us that he's a creature of the lake. There's even a little tribute to Jaws. That right there has got to be the shot they used for the cover of the NES game. Come to think of it, when I first became aware of Jason, this must have been the current movie. This makes it the Jason of my generation. The last 15 minutes is fucking awesome. You just have to wait through a lot of bullshit to get there. What we get here is a battle between Jason and Tina using her telekinetic powers. It's like Luke Skywalker against Darth Vader, or even better, as the director John Carl Beekler described it, it's Carrie versus the Terminator. It's one of the best sequences in the whole series, number three in my top 13 moments. Jason has really met his match this time. He gets all fucked up. For much of the fight, Jason goes unmasked, finally getting rid of the mask that he's been wearing since part three. They did such a great job with Jason's face that they're not afraid to show it. Spoiler alert, if you want to talk about the ending... It's pretty stupid. Tina's dad comes up out of nowhere and drags Jason down. The director hated it and said that dad was supposed to look like a zombie with full makeup and prosthetics, but the associate producer didn't like it, so instead it's just a normal looking guy. It would have still been a weird ending, but the zombie look would have definitely helped it. In conclusion, this is a great installment because it does something different, but it's mostly just the ending that makes it so worthwhile. It's uneven for sure, and after watching through a marathon of these movies, it can be tiresome. I do have to say, I like that the running time of all these movies is almost consistently uniform at an hour and a half. You know that they're never going to go over two hours like most movies today. Well, we're almost there. 
After seven Friday the 13th movies, there was almost nothing left to do, something that writer-director Rob Hedden was well aware of, who just happened to be working on the Friday the 13th TV series. Yes, for those who didn't know, there was actually a Friday the 13th TV series, but it had nothing to do with the movies. Anyway, he said to the studio executives, Jason has been in the woods for seven movies. Can we get him somewhere else, like a city? And that city turned out to be New York. Sounds like a great idea. Imagine all the shit Jason could get into in the big city. Well, well. Hmm. It begins with the guy and a girl on a boat. The guy just happens to be telling her the story of Jason, just as the boat happens to be cruising over Jason's corpse, dragging an anchor over an electrical cable, and electrocuting him back to life, just like in Part 6. The dude also just happens to have a hockey mask which he uses to scare his girlfriend. Moments later, the real Jason shows up, takes the hockey mask, and gets back to business. Next thing, Jason navigates the boat to, uh, the ocean. I guess Crystal Lake connects to the ocean now. He gets aboard a cruise ship where a bunch of high school graduates are celebrating on a trip to New York City. So that explains how Jason gets to New York City. Because that's what everybody wanted to see. He couldn't just pop out of a sewer hole or something. No, he has to ride on a boat to a cruise ship and that only takes about an hour. I'm not kidding. It's about one hour and four minutes by the time Jason actually gets to New York City. I don't think we would be complaining if the title of the movie wasn't Jason Takes Manhattan. But let's clear this up. There is a reason. And the simple answer is budget. Originally, Rob Hedden wrote scenes with Jason on the Brooklyn Bridge, at Madison Square Garden, the Empire State Building, you name it. But the cost of filming in New York City was too high. Even though this had the biggest budget of any of the Friday sequels so far, with an estimate of $5 million, still, New York City has to be the most expensive place to shoot besides Los Angeles. Because of this, they could only afford to shoot two days. Only two days in New York City. The rest of the city scenes were shot in Vancouver. That's not the only time that's happened. When Jackie Chan was shooting Rumble in the Bronx, they did the same thing. They shot Vancouver for New York City. Not because it looks anything like it, but just because it's a hell of a lot cheaper. But even with most of the city scenes in Vancouver, still the majority of the film is on that damn boat. When they finally do get to New York City, you're like, thank God! One of the two days, they were in Times Square, and while they were filming, Kane Hodder never broke character as Jason. People on the street would cheer for him, and he would just silently stare at them. Imagine how awesome that would have been to be in Times Square and see Jason. Also, I have to note, you can see the advertisements for Tim Burton's Batman. This was released in 1989, the same year, so it had quite the competition. As always, there's no rhyme or reason why Jason does the things he does, but now it's gotten to the point of comedy. He has a rage going on. He's legitimately pissed off. He could have killed any of those people, but instead he kicks the stereo just because it was in his way. Number four on my top 13 moments. There's another really funny moment that got cut from the final movie where he's on an escalator and pushes somebody out of the way. Moments like these are better than any of the kills, which were all compromised by the MPAA, like usual. Except this time, it's probably the worst yet. For example, after Jason throws a girl into a mirror, you would have seen her body with glass shards sticking out. That was cut. The only kill that still is worth a damn is when Jason punches the guy's head off. Number 10 on my top 13 moments. But what I didn't mention before was all the senseless punching leading up to it. He tries punching Jason over and over and over again. It drags way too long. Originally, this scene was supposed to be shot in Madison Square Garden, but now it's just a nondescript rooftop. The final girl, in an attempt to make her character more complex, had a traumatic experience when she was a kid. Her father was trying to force her to learn to swim, but while she was underwater, she saw Jason, who was a young boy. In the beginning, they say Jason drowned 30 years ago. I wonder if that counts the time it took Tina to grow from a young girl to an adult in Part 7. Who knows? 
not to mention the geographical mess with Crystal Lake now connecting to the ocean. But after all that, they still remember to give Jason a second hockey mask since the old one was destroyed in Part 7. They got that right, but why does it still have the same axe mark? Spoiler alert, if you want to know what happens at the end... Well, for the first time, I can say Jason is killed in an original and definitive way. He doesn't fall into the water again or get stabbed or some shit. He gets melted by toxic waste. The special effects could have been a little better, but at least they finally did something interesting. Overall, this is one of the worst installments in the series, if not the absolute worst, with shitty characters and weak kills. And when Jason finally gets to the city... It gets good for a little bit, and there are brief highlights, but the first hour on the boat kills it. It was the 90s, an age when heavy metal and slasher movies took a back seat. It was a boring time after having burned out on the 80s excess, there was nothing left for the 90s to do. I even remember firsthand seeing a newspaper ad for Jason Goes to Hell, and one of my friends commented saying, I'm so sick of that. Everybody knew the deal by now. So Paramount sold the rights to New Line Cinema, and even New Line considered this to be the last. Come on, really? Remember what happened with Part 4? You're gonna pull that shit again? At least this time, it was the last movie for a while. Nine years until Jason X. The director of the first movie, Sean Cunningham, returned as producer this time. It seemed significant in the same way John Avildsen returned to direct Rocky V, but even that wasn't the last. It begins with a girl taking a shower, which turns out she's deliberately trying to lure Jason out into a war zone of FBI agents who unload everything onto him and blow him the fuck up! This would have been the best ending to any of these films, but instead, it's the pre credit sequence. His remains are taken to a secret government facility where the coroner tries to do an autopsy on the little of him that's left. And then, this happens. Yeah. By the way, one of the security guards is Kane Hodder, who still plays Jason as well. Then the coroner begins killing people. We can already come to the conclusion that Jason took possession of his body, but they don't offer much explanation. Almost immediately, a bounty hunter is hired named Creighton Duke, who's the only guy who knows what's really going on with Jason. He's the closest you get to a Dr. Loomis type character. From this point on, Jason keeps killing people and switching bodies by transferring a worm-like creature into them. So I guess this worm is the actual Jason. This kind of stuff turns the mythology of the series completely upside down. It's like in Halloween 6 when they tried to give Michael Myers a reason and it got really fucking stupid. Jason Goes to Hell came out before and did a better job, but that's not saying much. There's a lot of horror references using names of directors. Because otherwise Landis is really going to kill you. Cunningham, Landis. It's more like a reference to Night of the Creeps because it's the same type of thing. What's the C stand for? Let me guess. Corman University? But here's one that's unexpected. The Necronomicon makes an appearance. The one from the Evil Dead movies. The book from Evil Dead is in this movie. They conclude that only a relative of Jason can kill him, so apparently there's other Voorheeses that we never knew about. Even more confusing, if he transfers his worm thingy into one of the family members, they become the real Jason, regenerating his original form, hockey mask and all. I still can't make out what the hell is going on. Every time I watch it, my brain shuts down, and apparently all of a sudden there's some kind of magic dagger which his relatives must use to kill him with. So, as the title suggests, Jason is sent to hell, I suppose. Um, what can I say about this one? It's a fucking mess. On the good side, I like the look they gave Jason. It's fresh and monstrous, with the mask barely covering his giant head. I like that we get some creature effects, and in general, it's a very different movie from all the others. Way different. It's not even a straight-up slasher movie. It's some kind of weird, dark, metaphysical nightmare. I can't even explain it. Is it good? Not really, but at least it isn't the same old shit. The shot with Jason's mask in the dirt is outstanding. It's an image that always stuck with me. Like, yes, it's finally over. But then, holy shit. This was a big surprise that Freddy Krueger is in this movie, even if just his glove, promising that Freddy vs. Jason would happen. 
And it did happen, but not after a 10-year delay and lots of talk, talk, talk in between. Happy Friday the 13th. At last, we have Jason X, a movie that comes right out and says, look, there's nothing left to do, so fuck it. It's Jason in outer space. We all know what it is, so take it or leave it. This time with the highest budget yet of the series, of an estimated $14 million, and with a sci-fi comedy setting like Alien Resurrection. It begins at the Crystal Lake Research Facility sometime in the future, the year 2008. <laughs> we all chuckle. At least that's when Jason is first executed for the murder of nearly 200 people. But after numerous execution attempts, they find out he's indestructible, so instead they cryogenically freeze him. Then we jump ahead to the year 2455. Hmm, we'll have a tough time surpassing that one. Some type of archaeological expedition brings a group of scientists to Earth to dust off the old research facility and find Jason frozen along with one of the scientists. This time, Jason gets back to business before he can even move. Oh, oh man! And in case you were wondering, this is how all female scientists dress in the future. Uh-oh, somebody's getting laid, and that's all it takes for Jason to get up again. And now for the Sub-Zero Kill, number five in my top 13 moments. <laughs> then we're explained what's happening in the most brilliantly self-aware bit of dialogue ever spoken in the whole series. Felt that a creature that couldn't be killed was simply too valuable to just file away. In the end, it always comes down to money. It's a fucking monster in a Friday the 13th film! But it turns out it's just a simulation, a virtual type game, sort of like the holodeck on Star Trek. What's really cool is that Jason kills them inside the sim, but then he gets to kill them all over again in real life. That's a good way to double the body count. You got a BFG? Did he say BFG? Like the gun from Doom? And he's so casual, they don't try to draw any attention to it. They slip it right in like it's perfectly normal there would be a BF fucking G. Big fucking fucking gun. There's a great scene where they create a simulation for Jason just to keep him distracted, and they do a repeat of the sleeping bag kill from part 7. I put this at number 2 in my top 13 moments, but that's only because he swings the sleeping bag more times. I wasn't aware that in part 7 it originally was several hits, but the MPAA made them cut it down to only one. Had it not been for that, I would have surely chosen the part 7 sleeping bag kill. An android fights Jason, blows him to bits, and then he regenerates as some kind of Mecha Jason, or Uber Jason as everyone calls him. What else is there to say? Jason X is completely insane. To say that this one is different from the rest is an understatement. It's as ridiculous as you'd expect. It's a terrible film, but it's lots of fun. Next came Freddy vs. Jason, a reminder that I've already reviewed that one. Basically, it's awesome. To see Freddy and Jason finally battle was a real treat. It gave us exactly what was promised. I should have put this at my number one moment, but I keep forgetting to count it as a Friday the 13th film. So you can say my top 13 moments was just for Jason Solo. After all, this was the biggest movie of the franchise with a $25 million budget. I also reviewed the 2009 version, which is sort of a remake of parts 1 through 3, with Mrs. Voorhees being slain early on, Jason with the potato sack, and finally with the hockey mask. This time Jason's in the woods again, back to basics. Nothing new, just with a larger budget of 19 million, making it much more polished looking than the original 3. I didn't hate this one, I just thought it was okay. There was no purpose of making it. Most of the time, I'm against horror remakes, but I feel as if with this one, they really didn't have a choice. Another sequel would have been difficult considering Jason went to the city, became a spirit possessing people's bodies, went to outer space and became a cyborg, and then fought Freddy. It was all fun stuff, but it was also refreshing to see him go back to the woods and back to basics. I just wish they could have called it something other than just simply Friday the 13th, because now, whenever you say Friday the 13th, it's like, oh, you mean the first one or the second one? I mean, not the second one, the remake, or reboot, re fuck it, the 2009 version. And what's the next one going to be? Part 2, Part B? Anyway, I don't have a whole lot to say about it. It was okay. If you ever saw one of these movies, it's exactly what you'd expect. People go in the woods and get killed. Same old shit. One thing kind of different is that it has the longest pre-title sequence in history. 
Everybody laughed. I liked it. Most of the characters were pretty ordinary. They make stupid jokes, they do stupid things, they go places they shouldn't go and get butchered, and they all deserve it. But there is one fairly sympathetic character by the name of Clay, who's not looking for trouble, but instead for his lost sister. On the opposite, there's a real dickhead named Trent, who you might remember as the bully from Transformers, played by Travis Van Winkle. They make him out to be a genuine asshole, and it works. I felt like I wanted to spit on the screen. But unfortunately, there's no real good payoff. He doesn't get any kind of special treatment, so that was kind of disappointing. The best character by far, and the whole reason to watch the movie, is Jason. He's a little more clever than the old Jasons. He preys on his victims in slightly more unique ways, rather than just being a lumbering zombie. In fact, he isn't a zombie this time, is he? Either way, it was great to see him back. He's just an icon on the big screen that just never gets old. The kills were good, but they weren't memorable. Just a machete here and a hatchet there, nothing we haven't seen already. Some people may like it when the death scenes are less over the top, but I was hoping for something more creative, like show me something I haven't seen. But if you're just expecting another Friday the 13th, it'll quench your thirst for blood and tits and whatever else. Now the ending. I'm not going to say exactly what happens, but I have to say it was so lousy, so predictable, so cliche, so uninventive and shamelessly tacked on that it came off like a spoof. And now there's talk of another one, which will be the 13th Friday the 13th film, and you know they'll only release it on a Friday the 13th. I think what we need to see next is Jason vs. Michael Myers, but that'll never happen. Whenever two different companies own each of the characters, it's almost impossible, because God forbid they'd have to split the profits 50-50. You know, 50% is more than nothing, which is what it's making right now. The Friday the 13th series has a similar kind of charm as Godzilla, because it's impressive and hilarious that there exist so many sequels for something that seems like such a simple concept. Its longevity is its legacy, and how we cheer for Jason as we do Godzilla, but none of the other characters matter much to us. These movies are far from perfect. Many of them are absolutely awful, but never without their highlights. We celebrate them for their flaws, taking them for what they are. We like discussing them, we like talking about what we like and dislike. So now I'm done with Friday the 13th. Time to move on.